Happy Easter. Now, for some of you that may not be aware, there is a tradition uh, on Resurrection Sunday where we, I say, He is risen, and you would answer with, He is risen indeed. And there may be some at home that aren't aware of that. So, He is risen. He is risen Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you would turn with me to the Gospel of Mark once again. We're going to be reading Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 18, uh, 1 to 8, sorry, this morning. The Gospel of Mark uh, chapter 16, starting at verse 1. It's also going to be up on our screen, I believe, yes. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Helps if I have these as well. I keep forgetting. <laughs> Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Father came home from a very rugged day and rough day at work and uh, said to his wife, I've had a really bad day. Please, if you have any bad news tonight, keep it to yourself. To which she replied, okay, no bad news. All right. Now for the good news. Remember that our four children? Well, three of them didn't break an arm today. Uh, most, most mornings, if you're like me, uh, you probably have the TV or the radio on and you're checking the weather and maybe checking traffic and, uh, and then when you take that information in, you, you make the appropriate decision about what you're going to wear maybe that day, uh, what direction you're going to take to get to work. Uh, it's news that we choose to live by and it causes us to act in a certain way. But I want to focus this morning on some news that can not only change our decisions that we make on a daily, uh, daily, but also change how we live. It's the news that was shared over 2,000 years ago, and it is still relevant today. And I think everyone longs for and needs to hear some good news. Since probably March of last year, we have certainly had a great amount of bad news. Living with this pandemic has been a time of economic and social tragedy, personal loss, trouble in our lives, uh, loneliness. And not only for maybe us as a country, but probably for, for many of you personally as well. Some of you have likely experienced financial struggles. Others of you uh, may have had to deal with some health issues, spiritual dilemmas, and so on. And there may have been a few of you that have 
been through a time of loss, hurt, and grief. This is the way the world is. A lot more bad news than good. The early disciples could relate to such a situation. And at this moment in time, they were filled with defeat and despair. Because of the abundance of bad news, most of us are always ready and overjoyed to receive some good news. Certainly, uh, these uh, uh, women disciples or followers of Jesus could, could use some good news as they were heading to the burial place of Jesus. But I don't think they had any reason to expect to receive any good news at the graveyard. This just is not the place for good news. This is a place of sorrow, grief, and, and maybe even some hopelessness. But God has a way of working and bringing good news in the worst possible circumstances. On that first Easter morning, they heard the greatest news of all. He is not here. He is risen. Jesus is alive. That is good news from the graveyard. In fact, this good news is so great that I, I believe it far surpasses any tragedy or trouble we have ever faced or will face. Why is the resurrection of Jesus such good news? What does it mean for you and me today, some 2,000 years after the fact? Well, I would dare say it, this may be the greatest miracle of all. It's a marvelous and miraculous thing that a man can be beaten with 39 strikes, have his beard pulled out, struck with fists, nailed to a cross, pierced with a sword in his side, wrapped in a burial cloth, and then placed in a tomb for three days, and then miraculously come to life. There can be little doubt that this was maybe the most marvelous and most amazing miracle we've experienced. This miracle was also validated as genuine. The eyewitnesses of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, the Roman guards who, who supervised that punishment, and the totally and radically committed disciples even to the point of a martyr's death, all attest to the reality of this miracle. When Jesus died, it, it appeared that his cause would likely die with him and that he would just become an obscure footnote in history. But oddly enough, it didn't happen that way. The followers of Jesus didn't fade into oblivion uh, in fact, they all came back bolder and more courageous than ever before. What happened? What, what made the difference? The only explanation, I believe, is the resurrection. The resurrection is not a, a religious myth. It's not some invention of man to, meant to inspire us with hope and positive thinking. The resurrection of Jesus is good news for all of us. And why is that? Because it gives us some wonderful assurances that we can hang on to in our lives. His resurrection makes some very important things very certain for us. So much so that we're not left to guess or have wishful thinking about these important life issues. Some things are just too important to, to not be certain of. I especially do not want to take a chance on spiritual issues such as Jesus' identity uh, or my eternal destiny. There's too much at stake to, to be uncertain. The good news is that none of us have to be in doubt about these important issues. The resurrection of Jesus gives us some wonderful assurances. So I want to just take a look at just, just a few of these this morning for a moment. Well, firstly, 
The resurrection of Jesus assures us that we're placing our lives in the right hands. I'm just going to read Romans chapter 1, uh, 1 to 4 here. This letter is from Paul, a, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at verse 4 there. Is it up on the screen? Did we have it up on the screen? Sorry. Okay, you're working on it. All right. Uh, Verse 4 notes that in that last phrase, it says that Jesus was shown to be the Son of God, when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Simply put, God did not leave us uh, without real evidence. He did not leave us without a declaration of who was the genuine person that we were to listen to, to commit to, and follow. It's vital because you don't, you don't want to make the, the mistake about an issue like that. There are so many people and philosophies that claim to be the truth or claim to be the way to God. We all place our our trust in something or someone. You You know, something as simple as trusting our vehicles to get us safely from home to our destination and back. You know, we trust our medical system to help us when we or a member of our family are sick or injured. And of course, there's many voices out there claiming to know the truth and clamoring for you to get your attention to listen to them. Uh, There are many philosophies or approaches to life that try to gain your attention or your commitment, like even like atheism or humanism, hedonism and the like. There's the voice of other religions Uh, out there like Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Islam, and so on. But we know to follow Jesus because only his grave is empty. Despite all these worldly arguments and their supposed appeal, we know to follow Jesus because he has proven that he is the Son of God through his resurrection from the dead. And even though we weren't there, the disciples were. And they believed it so strongly because they were witnesses to it. This one act validates everything he said and everything that he commanded. His resurrection brings assurance to us that we are not on the wrong track or that we're on the wrong path. He has done something that could only be done if what he said and claimed were true. This is part of the good news from the graveyard. Jesus is the all-state God. You know you are in good hands with Jesus. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus assures us that we are truly forgiven for our sins. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about Jesus' death and resurrection and its importance for the church. When Paul makes this statement, he's basically saying, if the resurrection isn't true, then there can be no, there can be no forgiveness for our sins. If Jesus had remained in the grave, it would have meant that God had not found Jesus' sacrifice acceptable for the forgiveness of everyone's sins. The resurrection was not only proof of who Jesus was, but it was also proof of what he had done for the world. Do you think of yourself worthy of forgiveness? Or do you feel the weight of the sins you're carrying? Is it like dragging hundreds of pounds behind you? 
Have you felt like you're unforgivable? Forgiveness given and accepted is an incredibly powerful gift. That is what Jesus' resurrection does for us. We don't need to wonder or to waver about the forgiveness of our personal sins because the king of the entire universe has made his decision. Jesus' sacrifice was enough to remove the guilt of our every wrong and the resurrection is proof that God has fully accepted his payment for our sins. I am fully forgiven. You are fully forgiven. You can be fully forgiven. I have zero doubts about that. We don't have to live with uncertainty as to our status as the citizens of heaven. Jesus thought we were worth going to the cross for. Now some people may have fears about forgiveness, but they're unnecessary because the resurrection of Jesus makes forgiveness a certainty. There is good news from the graveyard this morning. You do not have to live with uncertainty. You do not have to be uncertain about who Jesus was, and you do not have to be uncertain about your standing with God if you are willing to accept Christ's sacrifice for you. The resurrection of Jesus also brings assurance to another important area of our lives, our deaths. The resurrection of Jesus assures us that we are truly, uh, that we truly have hope beyond the grave. Uh, again, reading from 1 Corinthians 15, I, I don't know, I keep moving this, but apparently, uh, hopefully you, you can hear me okay. Yeah, the wind from my mouth probably. <laughs> Um, reading uh, from 1 Corinthians 15 again. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But, here's a big but, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And moving over to verse 54, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? We have hope beyond the grave. Hope that is more than wishful thinking. Jesus proved it by his own resurrection that the grave need not be the end and that it need not be feared because he has proven that he has power over death. In this passage uh, from 1 Corinthians, Paul points out that Jesus had, was indeed raised from the dead. And because of that, he has achieved victory and showed that he has power over our worst and most dreaded enemy, which is death. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That is, those who have died as, as believers. This is another way of saying that his resurrection was the first of many. His resurrection is evidence of many more to come, like the early fruit at harvest time. Okay, that's not loose. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's... Maybe it's the wire. Anyway. <laughs> uh, his resurrection is evidence of many more to come, like the early fruit at harvest time was the evidence of the full harvest to come later. Even though death still occurs, it no longer has the sting it once had because Jesus has achieved victory and given us assurance of hope beyond the grave. Jesus has broken the chains that weigh us down. 
Let me share this little story with you that I think helps illustrate. A boy and his father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon when a bumblebee flew in the car window. The little boy who, who was apparently allergic to bee stings was, was just petrified sitting there. The father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee and squeezed it in his hand and then released it. The boy was still frantic as the bee was buzzing around him. But once again, the father reached out his hand, but this time he pointed to his palm. And there stuck in his skin was the stinger of the bee. Do you see this, he asked. You don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. We don't need to fear death anymore. Christ has died and risen again. He has taken the sting from death for us. Let me give uh, one more assurance here this morning. The resurrection of Jesus assures us that we also have hope for today. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? And Jesus replied, the kingdom of God cannot be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. Luke 17, verses 20 to 21. It's not only good news for eternity, it's good news now. It's good news for today. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near. You can have that new life starting today. You can find freedom from Jesus, uh, freedom through Jesus from addictions. Jesus can restore your broken marriage. Jesus can take care of all your physical needs. This short passage uh, from Luke has Jesus conversing with some Pharisees, and he tells them that the kingdom of God is here. It's within their grasp. Jesus is saying it's not this elusive, airy philosophy, but it's something tangible that we can have today. People are looking for good news that changes their lives, not only for eternity, but for now, too. Pastor Dieter Zander, speaking at a, a conference, said, there's a difference between knowing the good news and being the good news. We are the evidence. How we live our lives becomes the evidence. Everything counts all the time. The good news is meant to transform us today, not just the future. That transformation uh, begins with the rec resurrection of what Jesus did by his death and resurrection. For those of, us, uh, those of us who are not willing to take a risk about such issues, we can now be assured we aren't taking a risk. We know. We, we have the answers. Jesus has given us more than words. He has shown us. And in the process of showing us, he has given us more than we could ask for. We really have received good news from the graveyard. And even though it may feel like the darkness is deeper, that's an opportunity for the light of Christ in us to shine brighter. Good Friday was dark. But with Easter Sunday, the light shines on an empty tomb. This good news can overcome any bad news that tries to overwhelm us. If Christ is not leading your life right now, make today the day you turn around and turn over your life to him. Jesus is calling. He's calling us into his kingdom. Honestly, it's the best news that we could hear and choose to live by. Let's pray. Jesus, we remember and we celebrate today what you did for us. 
what you did for us by going to the cross. And praise your name, Jesus. What you said happened. You rose from the dead. You declared in that one moment everything you said was true. Everything you said can be trusted. And everything you said can change our lives in this moment and in today, in the years of our lives, even into eternity. And so, Lord Jesus, thank you for that wonderful gift. But I know, Lord, there are many that do not follow you. There are many that have not accepted your truth as truth. They've not accepted your truth as good news. Uh, maybe they're afraid of it. Maybe they've ignored it. And maybe there may be some even still that have not really heard it before. And so I pray today, Jesus, that those that are hearing this news today would receive it gladly that would turn around at the nudging of the Holy Spirit and accept your sacrifice on their behalf and realize that it not only affects their eternity, but it affects today. And they can shout from the rooftops, you are risen. You are risen indeed. And you change the way I see the rest of my life. And help us, Lord, even though it may feel like the world is darker than it's been before, help us to shine your light brightly. In the darkness of the night, the stars shine so bright. Lord, may your good news shine brightly in and through us. Help us to not lose sight of why we're here. Help us to not lose sight of not only telling others about good news, but being the good news in our very lives, in our daily walk with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we just pray that today is not only a day of celebration for us, but a day of celebration uh, for those around us, for those in need of good news from the graveyard today. In your name I ask this. Amen.